and uh, we think that that is going to be increasingly common um, and that those risks are going to be magnified over the years um, as climate change uh, increases and speeds up. Um, for us, I think that the way we deliver against wildfires will need to change because the struggle that we faced last year was that um, all of our fire engines were tied up dealing with uh, dealing with wildfires. And what we need is more off-road vehicles, which we can crew with fewer firefighters, uh, which will allow us to tackle uh, those fires more swiftly. Um, and whilst doing that, free up the rest of our resources so we can continue to provide effective fire cover for um, other emergencies that might be happening uh, during those periods. We're also seeing uh, a, a spike in uh, fires caused by lithium ion batteries in people's homes and uh, and the increasing prevalence of battery electric vehicles being operated across the county. Um, uh, sector wide, it's an issue for every fire and rescue service, but we need to start preparing ourselves for what this uh, the impact of green technology is uh, on transport and in people's homes where stored energy um, battery systems are becoming much more common. Um, and for us, we carry out horizon scanning and we think about what's going to happen in the future, but we've got a four year window and now is a golden opportunity for us to start developing plans for dealing with this risk uh, before it becomes commonplace. So that's the intent of our first priority. I welcome your feedback on it. Our second priority is to double down on uh, a risk-based prevention program. So prevention is our provision of fire safety to people in their homes. Uh, it's a statutory duty. Um, and at the moment, we are working towards a, a, a person-centered approach to um, primarily safe and well visits where we go and visit people in their homes. Uh, but what we see is uh, some uneven uptake in those safe and well visits to residents across the county. And given that we only have a uh, limited resource to do this work, it's really important to us to make sure that the people that we're visiting are the most vulnerable people in society. And generally, the factors uh, that lead to increased risk in house fire are well known. Uh, so the key for us is to develop really effective partnerships with other agencies uh, to provide referrals uh, back to us so that we can ensure that we are getting to the right people. The traditional approach was to uh, visit an area by postcode, you can identify increased fire risk that way um, and we can map that. But that doesn't mean that everyone within that postcode area is going to be of a particular high risk or be particularly vulnerable. So we need to do a piece of work to ensure that our partnerships are really effective um, and are helping us uh, use our resource in the most efficient and effective way to get to the people who really need us. Uh, so that is priority two. Uh, our third priority is uh, to carry out a review of our uh, our response model across Berkshire. Um, so we are thinking about sustainability and, and value for money there, but our, our primary focus is, uh, is to ensure that we're really effective uh, when it comes to uh, delivering our statutory duties and we have the right resources in the right place. And for us, in the past, we've tended to focus mostly on um, where our fire engines are, but we also have uh, a variety of other vehicles uh, special appliances such as high reach vehicles, um, water rescue unit, off road vehicles. Those vehicles, we need to think really carefully about where they're located. And what this will help us do is cope with uh, low frequency, high severity events. Um, and it, it became quite clear after the Grenfell inquiry that um, for a fire and rescue service, it's not acceptable to uh, not plan for uh, outlying scenarios and doing this piece of work we think will help us become more resilient and have uh, have resources in the right place uh, to be able to mitigate some of those uh, some of those larger but more unusual risks um, generally uh, our feedback so far across all of our priorities has been pretty positive we we're, we're sitting uh, we're sitting for most of the priorities at about 90% acceptance rate um, of people agreeing with us. Uh, there are a couple which have dropped a little below that. Oh, apologies, I must go back. Um, 
Priority four is one of the slightly more controversial uh, priorities in our community risk management plan. What this priority says is that we are going to carry out a review of our statutory duties and then think about what we do with incident types that don't form part of our statutory duties. And in a nutshell, the Fire and Rescue Service's statutory duties are to attend fires, uh, to rescue people from crashed vehicles, to decontaminate people who have been exposed to hazardous chemicals, uh, and to have resource available to respond to building collapse, uh, train accidents, and um, a tram accidents. Luckily, we don't have any trams, so I don't have to worry too much about that. Um, but those are our core duties. But we also respond to um, water rescue incidents, flooding and animal rescue, uh, none of which we're funded for. So there is some challenge there around um, what our continued response to those looks like. So we want to really understand uh, what our statutory duties are to some extent. It's very complicated and we've had we have had pushback on this one from the public. Uh, primarily with people saying that if we don't attend these, then then who will, which is a completely valid argument. Um, those duties do rest with other agencies, so it may result in us having a conversation um, with Thames Valley Police around what does water response look like in the future. Although I think it is worth recognising that as a fire and rescue service, um, we will attend fires that are near water will attend boats that are on fire uh, buildings next to rivers uh, and uh, there are areas in the county like fries island in reading that we can only access by boat and there are buildings on there and we do have a statutory duty to provide fire cover there um, so we have to provide a safe system of work for our staff uh, on and around water and uh, we are a player in the local resilience forum and as a, a cat one responder in there we have a part to play in uh, the uh, multi-agency flood plans and we've made a commitment in there that we will respond to water so it's not straightforward um, but we think it is uh, we think it's worthwhile to consider what our role within these incident types is and uh, if we decide that we will continue doing all those things then we think that this gives us a lever to lobby uh for funding for the sector for these incident types um, so welcome your feedback on that priority five i think is a little more straightforward um we want to develop our fire protection service so this is the enforcement of fire safety law um, there's been a lot of new legislation uh, that has arrived post grenfell uh, we we have adapted and adopted uh uh, those uh, new requirements on us as a service and uh, we think that um, our enforcement is uh, is effective at the moment we have a risk-based inspection program and we target that uh, those mm, buildings that are the highest risk with our most skilled staff so our qualified fire safety inspecting officers um, what we think is that there's a tier of buildings that sit below those high and very high risk buildings that are uh, in that sort of medium to low risk bracket that don't get much involvement from the fire and rescue service and we would like to find a way to provide more uh, more education and guidance to people who are responsible for those types of buildings um, and so this priority we think will help us to do that and at the same time we will carry out a review of our risk-based inspection program to make sure that uh, our provision of fire safety uh, is being targeted at the right buildings and that we're not missing anyone. And again, it's a requirement uh, in the Fire and Rescue Service National Framework for us to have uh, a management system and a risk-based inspection program. So we will continue to deliver that work um, and we will look to build on the, on the current level of efficiency that we've developed. So priority six, um, says that we will provide a minimum of 14 frontline fire appliances using our whole time and on-call staff as effectively as possible. Um, 14 is our minimum. 
and uh, our chief fire officer Wayne Bocock is very clear that we are a fire and rescue service with 19 fire engines. Uh, it's just that five of them are crewed with um, with on call staff, um, and we will increasingly try to talk about our 19 pumps, but we will not uh, drop below a minimum provision of 14 fire engines at any given time. Uh, what we will look to try and do is use our on call staff more efficiently to support and work with our whole time crews. Uh, both both employment types are trained to the same standard, have the same equipment and do the same job. It's just a different uh, different employment method um, and it is more suited to a lower risk, more rural areas. Um, our whole time staff are, uh, are covering nearly all of our um, more urban areas, but we want to try and find ways to use our staff more effectively and uh, it's a real struggle to recruit and retain on-call firefighters. Uh, it's a, it's very much a um, 1950s sort of post-war model of employment, and it's not necessarily well suited to the way people live their lives today. Um, the uh, the days of the uh, bell ring at the fire station and people leaving the local shops and businesses to run down the high street and crew the appliance not really there anymore. Um, so we need to try. Really, we think to bolster that provision um, to ensure that we've always got that minimum of 14 uh, fire engines available to us at any time. So as part of the corporate plan, uh, we have a set of uh, strategic commitments that are owned by the fire authority and essentially all the work that we do will feed into the strategic commitments um, and uh, the logo that you see on screen uh, represents uh, all of the factors that the fire authority see as critically important to the successful running of a fire and rescue service. Um, and uh, the outer band uh, represents uh, uh, the more broader uh, environment that we operate in. So uh, ensuring that we're really effective at risk management and our community risk management plan is part of that. Having the right capabilities in place so that we can uh, we can stand up an effective response, um, that we run a sustainable both financially and environmentally um, organization. And I think at the top of the at top of the circle there, um, ensuring that we have the right culture where people feel um, supported and included uh, within our organisation, and, and we are acutely aware of the uh, of the national um, issues that have unfolded around uh, other fire and rescue services, um, and we are not naive enough to think that uh, those problems don't exist in our own organisation, and we are um, we are mindful of that, and we are taking action to. Um, to make sure that we've got a good culture for people to work in. Uh, and essentially within the inner ring, um, providing those three arms of the organisation that I talked about, but also um, having a really resilient, uh, uh, running a resilient organisation that is uh, available 24 seven is key to providing the protection that the community uh, pays for um, and deserves. So how to participate? Well, you're already participating. Um, and I thank you for your time tonight. Uh, it would be really helpful if you've got uh, if you've got any great contacts that you think would benefit from uh, from taking part in the consultation, then um, then I would welcome you sharing any of those contact details with me. That would be fantastic. Uh, we're doing pretty well at the moment, but uh, we can always improve. So if you do have any suggestions, then uh, please uh, get in touch and let me know. Uh, Louise has my email address. Uh, so I'll take any questions. If you have any, uh, please feel free to fire away. Thank you, Jeff. Jim, th thank you very much for that session. Um, if I may just kick, kick it off with the, the questions. With the, the number of uh, fire engines, have you actually got the staff to man 19 fire engines? Because it, it says in the consultation that you've always seemed to have staff for 14, um, but you can't, can't manage 19 because of staff absences and uh, training. So do we take it you've actually got sufficient staff to man 19 if everybody was 
as it were, in the office. So if everybody's on duty, then we can crew we can crew our 19 fire engines. The the challenge for us is that five of those fire engines are made up of on-call firefighters, um, and uh, and we struggle to get to full establishment on those fire stations. Uh, generally, um, across the whole time, fire engines we are we're not doing too badly. I think as part of this, when we look at our response model, uh, my suspicion is that we will work out that we need to employ a few more firefighters to bring our numbers up. Um, and that really is focused around uh, the fact that we have to extract staff really regularly because we do so much training and exercising um, that keeping people's competencies in date means that we have to take people out of service to, to put them through training courses. And what we need to do is double check our employment figures really to make sure that we've got enough people around all the time to permanently have those 14 fire engines available to us. Um, when we did our modeling, what uh, we went back over six years of incident data and what we found was that 96% uh, of the time, uh, if we had six fire engines available, we would be able to respond to everything that came uh, came at us uh, and that our peak demand. So the busiest we've ever been in the last uh, six years was to have 14 fire engines deployed at once. Um, but generally, um, as soon as we start getting above sort of five or six fire engines at an emergency, we'll start drawing on mutual aid from our neighbours uh, to come over because we'll always be looking to move our fire engines around to ensure that we've got sufficient fire cover. Thank you. Um, That's all right. Other Thank questions, you, Councillor Virgo and then Councillor Mrs Birch and Councillor Brossard. Tim, um, Councillor Virgo, uh, thanks for the, um, um, it, you know, the big uh, presentation. Um, I've got a few questions. First question is really about um, cladding, I guess, um, and general inspections. Um, I'm not quite sure where you are with that because there used to be general inspections for buildings in public places, and I understand that's not necessarily the case now. Um, and what powers do you have to close something down if uh, you feel that that isn't right? I suppose the cladding is a you know typical typical one that's the first question so I belt on or just let you do that one <laughs> no I'll, 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 I'm quite happy to answer that one so the um, so fire safety law changed in around 2005 Pri prior to that we would issue a fire certificate to a building so we would come out uh, it was very prescriptive we'd say that needs to be a fire door um, you know you need an emergency light here get that work done then we come back and issue a certificate um, and during the big uh, uh, it, it was really part of the fallout, the sort of bonfire of red tape. That that responsibility was uh, pushed down onto the own people who own and manage the building. So now it's entirely up to them to come up with a fire risk assessment, which tells them what they need, uh, and then we will turn up and audit the building, uh, look at their fire risk assessment, tell say whether it's suitable and sufficient, um, and then we can if, if we don't think it is we can enforce um, at that point because we, we we're still essentially the the police. Uh, for, for fire safety law. So when it comes to things like cladding, um, we've been running a, a built environment program for the last few years now, uh, identify, trying to identify all um, high risk, uh, generally it's tall residential buildings um, that have, uh, that have uh, dangerous cladding fitted to them. And we've been working with um, landlords uh, and building managers to get uh, get remedies put in place or workarounds in the form of things like waking watches or um, or, or, or enhanced fire detection systems to, to do that. Um, so yes, it's a really wide it's a really wide reaching problem, um, but our risk based inspection program is designed to to allow us to deploy our resources to those buildings as as our priority. Just, just a, a, just a secondary on that one. Do, do you think that, that that system works and the risk assessment which uh, companies do does? It's all bona fide, rather than you going in and saying you need this, you need that, um, which it used to be, didn't it? <laughs> do, you, do you want my? Would you like my my personal opinion, please, or, or, <laughs> or the corporate or a corporate opinion? So personally, um, I think that I. I can see the logic behind it. Uh, 
in, in, in an attempt to reduce uh, bureaucracy. But what I think it does do is it is it places an enormous responsibility on the building owner or manager or landlord to carry out a piece of um, fairly technical and, and skilled work in getting a fire risk assessment done. Some premises is quite straightforward, you know, a village hall with, with you know, with a, with a one door in and, and, you know, and a fire escape at the back, absolutely, you know, absolutely fine. Anything complicated, any any slightly unusual building, it becomes it becomes very difficult. And, and essentially that building owner or manager is legally on the hook and, and a breach of um, a breach of fire safety law is a, is a criminal offence. So it's a serious matter. Um, and and I I think it feels very burdensome on on people to to have to manage that. Uh, the alternative, I suppose, would be a return to uh, old school uh, uh, prescriptive rules, and we would have to employ an awful lot more fire safety inspecting mm -hmm. officers to go out and do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a it's a risk balancing scenario. But we you know uh, the tools that we have at our disposal are are essentially. Um, to uh, we can prohibit a building if we think that it's so dangerous that someone is you know immediately at risk. Um, we can serve restriction notices to limit the the use of a building, uh, or we can require certain works to be undertaken in the form of an enforcement notice um, if we find if we find deficiencies. So we we do have tools at our disposal to uh, to to enforce the law, but the bar is quite high. Okay. Okay, a uh, second question. Um, I, I, I just have two questions because other people will speak. Um, but can I just go back to the um, uh, the idea of the Swinley um, incident that happened in, in, in Berkshire? Um, have you considered, for instance, that we dump water from planes? Uh, would that have speeded up the whole process? And if so, have we got access to planes where we could do that? Or is that pie in the sky, Tim? I find the sky is a good metaphor for a plane. Um, so yes, it, theoretically we can we can request um, aerial firefighting, and we but we would do that um, through national resilience. So there's a national resilience mobilising uh, up in Liverpool, and we could formally request uh, request those assets are are deployed to us, and that agreement would have to go up. It sort of does a circuit round through uh, round through government. Uh, and then comes back out in the form of people or kit uh, uh, arriving, uh, arriving to support us. So um, it is in our national operational guidance. It, it is potentially a thing that we could get. Would we deploy it? Um, I think it's unlikely. I think our most our most effective uh, tool at our disposal is um, more off-road vehicles. Um, we think we would like to carry out more wildfire. Tra oh gosh, sorry, lights have gone in my office. I'm obviously <laughs> too late. Um, <laughs> um, sorry, where was I? Yeah, so uh, so we think training, we think training and some more specialist equipment is the way to go. And and for me, the the final part of the puzzle is um, it's very difficult normally to pin a cause through fire investigation on how wildfires start. Um, so prevention is a little bit challenging. But I think that the answer is is in trying to build really good relationships with land managers, landlords and landowners uh, to talk to them about fire breaks and to understand what kind of risks they are. So if we've got really good mapping in place with access points and tracks um, and we already know who owns and manages that land, then um, that's a really big win for us from a wildfire perspective. Uh, and we've got good relationships um, with, with the Forestry Commission and with the Royal Household, um, but I'd like to build on them. Sure. OK, thanks, Tim. I'll leave to someone else. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mrs Birch. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was actually... Um, the chairman actually mentioned one priority, which was six that I was going to talk about. I've already done the survey and actually Thank you. It, <laughs> it touched, I, I, I wrote in, you know, you know, you are the professionals, basically is what I've said, I paraphrase it. And, um, you know, we rely on you to make sure the response times are, are good and mm. that also this is for your safety as well. You know, it's not just safety of all, all of us, it's actually safety 
of the firefighters, and I'm very keen on this, what I would like to make sure in this that you are effectively making sure that you do have enough people and that you are safe. And that is really key. And I, I'm not sure that came across. So that was my comment there. Do you have anything to say? Sorry, I'm a bit, I'm facing this way and you're <laughs> that way. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you, Councillor. Um, you know, do I have anything to say? Yes, I do. I'm, 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 I'm touched and I'm really pleased uh, that your, um, your take on this is that, uh, is that our safety is important. And, um, and that, me that means a lot to me. And I do wonder, uh, whether we whether we should have been more explicit about that in this document, um, I think that is I think that's really valid. Um, we really care a lot about uh, we, we care a lot about each other, and the last thing that I or, or any of my colleagues want to see is our staff uh, is our staff being uh, being hurt at work. Um, we're very careful, and we you know our, our primary focus is really on. Um, on managing risk and not just this sort of broader community risk, but it's drilled right into us from from the first day That's of our it, employment <laughs> um, about being about being safe at work uh, and uh, and and you know risk assessing our environment is absolutely critical to us because um, we can't we can't guarantee a safe workplace where we go is dangerous. Yeah. Um, so thank you, but I, yeah, I, I do appreciate that, and um, I will. Uh, I will reflect on that because I think it probably um, has is underplayed in this document. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so I've got another point to make. Uh, I'm very keen on prevention mm. and education, and I know that obviously you go into schools, but I think there is a gap in education with adults, mm. um, and I th I would like to hear your views on that. And I I mean I am a quick reader, and I went through all this, but. I'm not sure that that was really evident either. So that was one of the comments I made. Yeah, so I think um, our education provision to adults possibly isn't as developed as it could be. So we tend to focus on uh, on interventions in, um, in with children when they're at school, mm. uh, and we do uh, our safe and well visit. And we, those are targeted primarily towards the, those those sort of most vulnerable adults. Um, and in, but in terms of other education, it's generally water safety and uh, and road safety initiatives that we run. Mm. But I think sort of broader fire safety education for adults, um, unless you are one of those most vulnerable people, perhaps uh, perhaps you are less visible on our radar. And I wonder if there is another tool for us that we could deploy around um, enhancing. Uh, enhancing what education offer we make, um, and, uh, you know, and I guess like everything these days, we rely a lot on social media to deliver um, deliver safety education messages quite broadly. Uh, the risk, I guess, with that is that not everyone is um, is is online and has that technology available to them. It's it's not for everyone, but but, but that is um, that's a real key area of our work for us at the moment. So thank you. My last comment is, um, I'm aware that you get nuisance calls, you get, um, you know, and I'll, I'll be quite interested in, I don't know whether you've got any statistics you could send us, but that would be quite interesting to know about. And I felt that that was another aspect that wasn't actually highlighted, because that's part of the education to educate people not to actually call the fire service when they don't need it, or to actually prank a prank or a nuisance call or whatever. So that was my other comment I made online. Thank you very much. Yeah, we don't get a huge amount of nuisance calls. We do get some, um, but not not lots and lots. Uh, and I think, well, what we do get a lot of calls to is um, is automatic fire alarms, loads and loads oh. and loads. Uh, so um, so we will be doing. If we have carried out a piece of work uh, last year to try and reduce the impact of those. Uh, we've got a review going to the fire authority about that, and uh, and we think we're going to have to carry out more work because the Majesty's Inspectorate of Fire and Rescue Service have told us that we do uh, to try and further reduce that. But if you'd like me to look for stats on how many um, how many malicious calls or nuisance calls we get, I'd be more than happy to do that. Thank you. Pleasure. Chairman, that's it. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brossard. Right, Chairman. Th thank you, Tim, for that most informative presentation. I've got a couple of questions. The first one is to do, and you mentioned about lithium-ion batteries. 
we mm. have a problem here in Bracknell, I suspect probably throughout the country, of residents who throw away into their green bin that then gets transferred into the refuse truck that when exposed to moisture then causes a fire whereby the contents have to be deposited on the road, the fire brigade have to come along. I think that's an education situation. Mm. My question, though, in some ways extends beyond that with regard to electric vehicles. And I think, for instance, of Teslas, and one particular example in America where Tesla caught fire, bizarrely, where the two, it hit a tree and bizarrely, the driver and the passenger were in the back seat, but be that as it may, um, the fire brigade took four hours to extinguish the fire. So I wonder if there now needs to be a new material to actually deal with electric fires, whether it's a foam retardant or some sort of shroud that can be put on to starve it of oxygen. Is that research that's being done by the, on a national basis to see what the solution is? Because electric cars are here to stay. That's my first question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, I could I could talk for hours about this, so I'll try not I'll try not to. Um, uh, So-called zombie batteries going into into refuse trucks and landfill are a problem. Um, I think that's a I think that's an education campaign that that needs needs to continue. There is some education work that's that's being delivered around that, um, but it will continue to be a problem. Um, dare I dare I suggest that it's a it's a it's a, a matter for local authorities to to look at the um, recycling facilities for batteries um, outside of my area of expertise. I'm afraid um, vehicle fires, though, uh, yeah, huge issue for us. Um, a, uh, a a car, an electric car, uh, on fire with a battery in thermal runaway can take up to 24 hours to fully extinguish, and there there are documented cases of vehicles uh, reigniting. Uh, uh, well after that time when they've been transported to the scrapyards. They're really, really difficult, uh, really difficult to put out. Um, the clouds of white steam that they generate when, they're, when they are uh, starting to catch fire are highly toxic and a real uh, potent mix of um, toxic and corrosive chemicals. And they also generate their own supply of hydrogen and oxygen as the lithium ion batteries decompose. Uh, uh, so they self-heat and and produce oxidizers and more fuel. So they will burn and burn and burn. And by their nature, inside an electric vehicle, they're built it normally into a kind of skateboard configuration in the chassis, uh, and they're sealed uh, and they're designed to be waterproof. Uh, so from from a fire and rescue service perspective, really difficult uh, to to put out. And uh, the uh, well, there's there's two kind of primary ways at the moment: continuous application of lots of water. Um, or uh, we have started to see some sort of giant fire blankets being produced that you could drag over a car um, and then starve it of oxygen. My concern around those is the minute you lift the fire blanket, then there's a, there's a real potential there for it to reignite because you've not done any cooling. Um, you're just trying to starve the fire of oxygen. Um, a secondary problem with 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 uh, electric vehicle fires is that. Um, we uh, we have a duty under various bits of legislation to control any pollution that we make um, and fire water runoff from an electric vehicle is contaminated with all sorts of um, heavy metals and other chemical types and um, we can't we can't just let that discharge into the drain so uh, so we will need to find a solution for dealing with that water um, and, and for me the, the the worst case scenario is a is a car on fire. Um, on a junction on the M4 uh, that we have to then close for you know up to 24 hours to deal with. Um, so yes, we we really need a plan, um, and there is work nationally being done to look at that. So I think there's the the sense within um, within Royal Berkshire is that we will um, look to get staff members involved in those national level projects, and we will look to adopt. Uh, uh, good practice as it's developed nationally, but at the moment it's it's very much in its infancy, um, and I hope that it, that technology catches up in time for the uh, for the demise of the internal combustion engine and um, and the, and the really widespread adoption of electric vehicles. Um, at the moment, we haven't had that many of them, uh, but I think it's um, I think it's going to become an increasing concern for us, and also with people charging them on their driveways as well. So if you have a battery that fails in a car on charge outside someone's house, you're very likely to find that their house is on fire as well. 
um, given the um, ferocity of some of those fires that can develop. So we think, uh, yeah, it's going to be an interesting time. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, very much so. Thank you for that, Tim. The second question My that pleasure. I've got, I wondered whether, in terms of the borough providing you, do you actually see planning applications? I'm thinking specifically of, for instance, high-rise flats or maybe three, four, five-storey levels and also offices with regard to providing an input on whether it would be appropriate to install a sprinkler system in new developments. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yes, we do. So we're a statutory consultee, um, uh, and when um, when uh, uh, a, a plan is, has been drawn up and sent into the planning department, as it's going through its building reg scrutiny, it will come to fire, um, and it will go to our fire safety department, and we will look at the plans, um, and we can pass comments on those plans. Uh, ultimately. Um, it's not for us to enforce the building regs and that that is up to those planning departments but we will provide um we will provide words of advice on the plans and their and what we think their suitability is um at that point uh so so we are cited on plans uh sprinklers um we our our policy is that we will routinely recommend sprinklers in buildings um uh, professionally, I'd really like to see uh, I'd like to see government adopt the Welsh approach of requiring all new dwellings to have sprinklers or misting systems fitted. Um, I think it would uh, it would save uh, save a lot of lives going into the future. But we we are not there. Um, so at the moment, all we can do is uh, add some supplementary words onto any plans that come our way and suggest that a developer considers uh, considers putting sprinklers in. Um, most most won't, uh, but but we live in hope. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Porter. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Tim. Uh, both the, this follows on a little bit from Councillor Brossard. He sort of like touched on it a little bit. Um, permitted development, especially of office blocks. Um, you were talking about it goes to the planning officers. Well, that permitted development doesn't go to uh, the planning department. And I know that, that some of them are starting to cause problems. Uh, and I know you're investigating a few with the public protection, especially in West Berkshire and Bracknell. So can you see um, that there's going to be more problems raising their heads uh, if we continue to have this permitted development with no regulation that it needs to really go before planners? Yeah, I think... Um Personally speaking, it's it's a concern for me. Um, I can understand why, given the housing crisis, that is that is a solution. Um, but the, in my experience, the quality of development of um, office blocks into dwellings is uh, is really varied. Some are fine, uh, and some are not so good. Uh, and the problem that we have is. When we do find out about the ones that have uh, have suffered from a poor quality conversion, particularly around fire safety, because changing, uh, forgive me, you probably already know, but ch but changing the use of a building means you'd need to completely change the fire compartmentation within that building to go from office use to uh, to dwelling. And if that compartmentation is is done poorly, um, by the time we find out about it, the cost to remedy can be uh, can be absolutely enormous. Um, so I think it's going to be it's going to be a growing concern. Uh, those buildings do feature on our risk-based inspection program, but as you say, we have to we have to find out about them first. So uh, so that's a uh, that's an issue. We, we we do need that local intelligence coming into us, um, and we don't get it through the planning route. So that's um, that's always going to be a uh, a challenge, a significant challenge, and I think. Uh, uh, as we look at the plans, you know, in, in, for example, in Reading, there's no space to build outwards. So the only the only way to go is to build up. And as post, you know, with the with the kind of cost of living crisis and the change in um, people's working habits to work more from home, um, we think uh, much more office space is likely to become uh, is likely to become homes, and it's really going to change the risk profile for urban areas. Um, and I would imagine that Bracknell will be um, will be one of those areas that will be seeing a lot of this. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, Councillor Bedibo. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, for the presentation. Uh, first of all, what's the difference between 
Royal Berkshire Fire Authority and Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service. Okay, so uh, so the fire authority is made up of elected members um, from the unitary authorities ac across Berkshire, uh, and um, they provide all of our all of our governance and decision making and and um, scrutiny and oversight. And uh, I guess the uh, the fire and rescue service is, is the uh, executive arm. So we we are the doers, uh, the firefighters, um, and the operators who kind of uh, sit beneath the fire authority. So our chief fire officer uh, Wayne reports to the fire authority and the chair of the fire authority, and they make uh, make decisions around uh, our budget um, and how we run our organisation. Thank you. I was just wondering why the rescue is missing from that, uh, from the first one, instead of just well, fire. Well, ju that's well spotted, because because uh, uh, according to um, the Fire and Rescue Services Act, it, it should be Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Authority, but for some reason, Berkshire has just kept it as uh, Royal Berkshire Fire Authority. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, my second question is... Uh, how do you determine how many engines are located in each area? So uh, we we have run. So we've got we've got two bits of software. So we've got a, uh, a risk mapping software, um, which is populated with all the data from the latest census, uh, and uh, and we can map out um, across all the lower super output areas in Berkshire. What, for example, what dwelling fire risk looks like across the county, or we can see where our where our flooding risk is, um, and then we have another bit of software which we will run, which shows us, for example, the travel times from a set location. So we can use those two bits of software. We could um, we could use it to generate a theoretical ideal location for X amount of fire stations in the county, um, and you could come up with, you know. The perfect spot for the for the fire stations, uh, but I guess in in practice, our fire stations are where they are for for for, for historic reasons, um, and we're to a great extent uh, quite tied to them because it's so expensive and time consuming to find land and build new fire stations that moving moving location is a fairly big upheaval for us, and generally, I think uh, we're we're likely to. Uh, stay put in our locations more often than we would we would move them. But yeah, I suppose there's there's an optimum uh, dispersal of fire engines that you you could you could look at to achieve. But I don't think in practice we'd ever uh, we'd ever be able to get to that point. But and numbers of fire engines wise, well, I mean budget comes into play. Um, and I mentioned earlier around the uh, the fact that we look at we look at how much demand we've got. And then we try and resource against that demand to ensure that we've always got the right, uh, the right number of uh, firefighters on duty and the right number of fire engines at any given time. And we think uh, we are um, we are about on the money at the moment. Thank you. Uh, my Pleasure. third question: uh, Your priority four. It's, I'm, I'm trying. In my, I tried in my head to try and think of. Uh, incidents that you could drop mm. because of the nature of what you are, fire and rescue. I'm assuming everything that you're called to come and attend needs you. I mean, if you don't do it, you, I think you said in your presentation, who else is going to do that? Mm. So uh, how, how would you prioritize and what are you likely to drop, for example? So I think there's kind of two elements to the answer on this. And the first is uh, we need to be absolutely certain that we're really, really good, top notch at delivering against our statutory responsibilities. Um, we need to be excellent at putting out fires. We, you know, we want to be uh, one of the best services in the country at rescuing people from vehicles. Um, and we need, and I think our, our our senior leadership team are seeking assurance that we are really good at that. Um, and they want to double down on it, and I can understand why, uh, because they carry that they carry that responsible organisational responsibility with them. Um, but we do do other things like animal rescue and like water rescue uh, and flooding, responding to flooding, that we aren't funded for at all. Uh, and so for the question then arose: Well, um, 
how much resource have we got dedicated to doing those other things and and to what expense is that against uh, doing the things that we're we're paid funded and legally required to, to do um, and I think to some extent there's a there's a, there's a need for us to understand what our financial envelope is going to be um, and then think very you know if things get much worse then where would we go to ensure that we're still able to deliver against those legal requirements so that's where the, that conversation came from um, I, I do still think it, it's it's it would be a very difficult move to say well we're not going to go to flooding anymore because legally we we could do that um, but it then becomes a moral question doesn't it if no one else is equipped to do it so um, who's going to go if you in law the police have the responsibility to search for missing people and, and people uh, in the rivers or in lakes um, fall under that remit um, but Thames Valley Police don't have that capability and are configured completely differently. Uh, so I think that we will continue to do water rescue, but uh, but but this will then become an enabler for um, for our chief fire officer and uh, for the chair of the fire authority to lobby central government for um, for funding for this. Uh, after the pit review from the floods in uh, forgive me 2007. Mm. Uh, uh, that that review said that um, there should be central funding uh, for flood and water rescue and, and that, that that fire authority should become responsible for that. Um, and that was rejected primarily uh, due to um, some voluntary agencies that I think felt that um, they would be more comfortable if uh, if that didn't happen for, what, for whatever reason. So I think there were some politics that played out around um, around that arena and we are still uh, we are still suffering because of that thank, thank you for that I, I think this is going your priority four is going to be a hard sell to the public yes and i think it's probably an opportunity for you guys to get more funding from central government because i think the public will back you on this uh because no like i said nobody wants to call you guys and n not have you guys show up mm. uh and lastly i just is this is just the feedback from uh the uh, survey. Uh, now, I could not disagree with anything on your plan. So you giving me two choices of agree or disagree yeah. was kind of unf unfair, really, because I couldn't say I disagree. Uh, it's, it's not possible. I will have loved something to give me a scale. Mm. So, so that also I think you guys also helps you guys to get a good judgment about what I'm thinking as a, one of the people completing the form. But uh, generally, I think you know you guys are, you do a wonderful job, uh, and I thank every one of you guys for putting yourself you know uh, and going beyond and above the call of duty. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Councillor McLean. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, your corporate plan and risk management plan. Have you had an opportunity to incorporate any recommendations or outcomes from the? Manchester Arena inquiry in those plans. So timing-wise, they didn't. They haven't really lined up. Um, but we do have a, we, we do have people looking at the outcomes of the um, outcomes of the Manchester Arena inquiry. Uh, it's um, you know it's a terrible tragedy, and uh, and it's um, it's really sharpened the, really sharpened the minds uh, for us. Um, and uh, and and it is going to result, I hope, in some uh, in some change longer term. But no, it's not it's not explicitly part of this piece of work, but it is a separate strand of work within Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, that's helpful, and I'd be interested to see how those plans develop over time. But if I could just take the opportunity to 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 echo what Councillor Badibo said. You're, you're asking people, your people, to put themselves in harm's way. Um, and um, I think we should all share our appreciation to you and your colleagues for what they're prepared to do. Thank you, Councillor. Absolutely, Robert. Um, Councillor Tina McKenzie-Boyle, who's virtual. Tina? Yes, thank you very much indeed. Tim, 
And I just say I've had the honour of serving on the authority since 2015. And a number of the issues that have been raised tonight, we have raised them in order to get to the point where we are. There they are, manageable risks, and they have been identified, which is great. So very proud and thank you very much for the fantastic presentation. Can I just do one little question? Have we touched on how legally responsible are we, sorry, the authority, I am one of you guys, uh, yes. girls and girls, uh, to attend any terrorist attack? Oh, well, that's been, that has been something of a, something of a political hot potato. Um, and it depends, I think, uh, where you are viewing that problem from. Uh, so uh, the Fire Brigade Union, for example, uh, think that the attendance at uh, terror incidents sits outside of the uh, sits outside of the role map of the firefighter, the job profile. Um, I think they think that because what they would like is uh, is pay and training and equipment. Uh, to be provided uh, for that role. And I have some sympathy with that. Um, the National Fire Chiefs Council has taken a very different approach, and I know that uh, that the Home Office takes takes a different tack on that as well, um, which is that uh, they see uh, terror incidents as an emergency and and well within the remit of, um, of, of firefighters to attend those incident types. So, uh, I have to say, uh, I think it, it is the job of the Fire and Rescue Service to attend terror incidents. Um, we do have capability in Berkshire for that. So we're linked in uh, with through, um, it's called the National uh, Interagency Liaison Officer Role um, into counter-terrorism policing. Uh, we do have a multi-agency uh, response capabilities stood by there um, and we work in partnership with the other fire and rescue services uh, across the Thames Valley to deliver that uh, 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week. Uh, Berkshire also has a um, a group of officers who have, um, uh, have enhanced training ballistic protection equipment um, and will respond to um, will respond to a terror incident as part of a specialist response capability. Um, and that's uh, that's available through national mobilising as well. So so um, so the facility to respond to terror incidents is is embedded within Royal Berkshire. Um, we're ready to do that, uh, irrespective of what's going on um, in that national debate. Thank you very much indeed for that explicit um, response. Again, I'm so proud to be part of you guys and girls. You absolutely fantastic. And it, when people say very brave, you are brave when you sign that form to be a firefighter. That's when the bravery starts. And we thank you very much indeed. Oh, thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Tina. Uh, members, I don't have anybody else identify any questions. One very quick question. Yep. Tim, can I just ask you, just give us an idea. When you call a pump to... Um, to an incident, how much does that cost? So people understand this roughly. Would you know that? You know what? I could. I, I can find out. I can't remember what it is, and I'd have no idea given the um, inflationary changes. Uh, but there is a there is a set there is a set cost. So we do have a facility to charge for special service calls. We, uh, Berkshire doesn't doesn't do it. Other fire and rescue services will do it. So they'll charge to attend. I don't know an animal rescue or pump out someone's swimming pool or you know do do some task like that that is is isn't classed as a sort of primary duty emergency so i can find out um it's not cheap <laughs> no i think it's just useful for people to know if they do it you know and it's wrong that costs so much money oh it? yeah absolutely it's, it's hundreds it's hundreds of pounds an hour well thank you very much and and can i just amplify everybody else and say thank you for what you do and your staff as well yeah. brilliant uh, pleasure yeah thank you. Um, um, tony can, and um, bob can i just say we've had some incidents in crowthorn where we needed to have our um on call and i asked the chairman of the authority at that time councillor dudley and he said it was in the region of 750 quid yeah that's about, sounds about right to get the appliance and the um and the crew on so that is a huge amount of money to come out to a malicious, a huge amount of money to come out to, um, should we say, people who should be not behaving the way they are. 
So it's a terrible cost. And would that cost come to the taxpayer? Is that right? Is that seven? Well, that's yeah, I guess that includes all of the on costs, uh, you know, yeah, training, yeah, pensions, yeah, yeah. hourly rates, diesel yeah, for the exactly. fire engine, yeah, equipment, yeah. absolutely so, everything wrong. So it's it's a huge amount of money. Yeah. So that's to be considered. So thank you very much. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Tina. Tim, I think that concludes our questions. I, I think everybody here can't thank you enough for coming this evening, um, educating us and giving us full frank answers, um, I think we ought to just show our appreciation in the usual way. <laughs> it's, it, it really is an interesting evening to learn about the work and the people that do the work are there. I think for me, the 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 one point I'm going to take away from here and remember is electric cars. I have to say, I find that extremely concerning. Mm. That here we are with a, with a date put on us by, by government um, and we're going to have all these thousands and thousands of electric vehicles and right now we haven't actually got the means of putting out the fire easily, quickly, that we should have. Uh, and that should have been one of the first considerations. And um, if I'm right, I think they've recalled all the cars in America, haven't they, Tesla cars, because of uh, fire risk. So but that's me just wrapping up. <laughs> but <laughs> thank again, you, Chair. thank you very much. No, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed, I've really enjoyed talking to you all tonight. So yeah, we're, we, you know, we're more than happy to attend council meetings. If you, if you have fire related questions, then it's, 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 it's a pleasure for us to send an officer along and it's really nice to get such a warm reception. Um, needless to say, you know, the problem of car fires is, is, is one that, um, is one that we will resolve. Uh, we just need to, we need to get a good run at it, but we'll, we'll get ourselves there and a solution will, a solution will uh, inevitably materialise. So, um, so thank you all for, for bearing with me. I was worried I was going to be a bit boring, but um, it's, it's, been, <laughs> it's been a real pleasure. I've Far enjoyed it a lot. Thank, <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you very, very much. much. Oh, and I'm, I mustn't forget before I go, um, Faith sent her apologies. She had to, she had to rush off to deal with another matter. So I was, uh, I was on my own tonight, but she just wanted me to let, uh, to, to let you, uh, let you know that that was the case okay thank you thanks very much fantastic Perfect. right i shall i shall leave you now then chair um thank you all for your time goodbye thank you good night kevin chair if i could just to um advise the commission that um we are looking to bring forward in the cycle um our blue light services to talk to the commission on a regular basis so this is our sort of first opportunity to bring the fire service. We'd like to see the ambulance service as well as health turn up to the commission. So I, I hopefully members found that useful and we need to make sure that we've got that opportunity to ask questions and to encourage a greater debate about what services are provided locally and how those services are deployed for the residents of Brat Bracknell Forest. Thanks Kevin and I'm sure um, members would be as interested in the subject matters that are coming forward under what you just described as what we are with the people we, we already have come to help us in, in their scrutiny work. So thank you. Um, moving on. Yeah. Um, I, I sort of lost track of where um, the chief executive and the council structure comes into the sort of gold, silver command structures in terms of emergencies. Is that something that will also be explained when we talk about that? Short answer is yes, absolutely. We can, we can run through that. There hasn't been substantial changes, but I think it's, um, I mean, certainly through COVID, um, they, they were heavily utilised. So we can, we can reflect on that and, and reflect on whether there are any, any learnings from that process, whether there might be any changes. And Chair, just to, to add to that, obviously um, under the Civil Contingency Act, we are a tier one responder. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we uh, as an incident opens up, we are part of that decision making process and we can call as an independent organisation uh, a critical incident. 
So, um, and I think what we've seen through COVID is that the local authority is a convener of place, um, bringing together all of those different agencies and that can deploy. So we saw a lot of work through COVID in terms of how members fitted into that process. Also, we've got that opportunity now through scrutiny to then look at how did that work in terms of coordination of services. So yes, I think it's really important that we remind ourselves in terms of our responsibility in terms of civil emergencies, and particularly when we're looking at place, how do we make sure that all of those agencies, police, fire, ambulance, coordinate with the community rather than they do their piece, and then we find ourselves there's a gap. So I just want to follow up on that. For just ask, do you do like a test run, like a fire, what's it called, a test then, once in a while, with, to make sure that everybody's on board with whatever the plan is? For example, we have the lexicon, there might be a terrorist incident, God forbid, or something like that. Yes, Chair, so um, uh, we, we have the Joint Emergency Planning Unit, which is in my directorate, and we share that resource with uh, West Barks, uh, the Royal Borough and ourselves. Um, we extensively exercise with the uh, Thames Valley uh, Resilience Forum. So we'll go up to Oxford and we'll um, play out scenarios to, to see how those services coordinate, and including our um, utility partners. So we do lots and lots of rehearsals. I think what um, we're keen to do is to make sure that you know, as uh, the fire uh, uh, officer was saying, there are the common things that we have well rehearsed. There's the things that we haven't rehearsed, which are more extreme, but actually, as we've seen with COVID, um, the number one risk register, the number one on the risk register was flu pandemic, and it still caught us unawares. So um, we need to look at that risk profile and perhaps rehearse some of the things which look more extreme, but actually, um, We've seen that recently, um, before COVID, we were thinking about um, roaming terrorist activity because of the Mumbai uh, incident. So we need to be looking at some of those other risk factors, which traditionally we haven't had within Bracknell because we haven't got some of those natural um, events which turn up regularly. But climate change has changed the demographic and we need to look at flash flooding. Um, extreme heat was the last one where we knew what our plan was, but. I don't think we would, as an organisation, really had thought about um, if that extended heat period was for five or seven days, how would we, how would our most vulnerable um, residents cope? So that's what we need to start rehearsing, I think. Thank you, Kevin. Right, item seven is the council plan overview report. Um, I'm sure members will note we're getting closer to the dates when when this report is produced and it comes before us. So we're not quite there yet, but uh, this one goes up to December, the quarter to December, so it's uh, a lot closer than what we've had in the past, I can say. Um, Chief Zek, over to you. Thank you very much, Chair. And just, just a brief summary, um, an overview. If I may take that point first, in terms of, um, uh, last time I reported back to you, we were talking about how we'd improve the report itself. Um, and now you see before you within the report um, the proposal that we are looking to um, ensure that we are getting more and more timely with this information to um, this commission so that um, it can view it. And the proposal is to review the performance information before it then goes to the executive. Um, that gives you an opportunity to um, uh, consider any, any suggestions or recommendations that you may wish to put. Um, an executive can consider those. But it, as, as exactly as you say, Chair, it gives you that opportunity to see more timely data. And I think that's, that's the key here, um, so that we can respond as an organisation swiftly. Um, in terms of the report itself, in terms of uh, the Q3 performance, Again, a solid delivery uh, against the actions um, and the performance indicators. Um, some key achievements that are highlighted uh, within the report, uh, the launch and, and promotion of the seven community winter hubs um, that were implemented across the borough, uh, including the, wellness, uh, sorry, the winter wellness activity program, 
and the community hub, uh, which was opened in the Princess Square to support the Ukrainian and other displaced um, nationalities, um, which is proving um, very successful. And I'll give you a Q4 update. Well, shortlisted for an award for the IEZ Awards as well. We got bronze for that, but that's a Q4 um, uh, update. Um, we've also um, uh, hosted part of the Running Out of Time Relay, um, which was the COP26 relay through from Glasgow to Shamal Sheikh um, for the COP27 um, event. So that went through um, Bracknell Forest um, Borough, which was uh, a good event. Um, and we, uh, with regards to schools, the schools offered their performance um, at, at the time of Q3 is further improved and we reported in Q, Q3 and 97% of schools rated as good or better. That of course has, has improved again. Um, and again, just talking about awards, the town centre reactivation projects were highly commended in the European um, SOLAL, S-O-L-A-L awards and that's our first international award. So some very good news there as well. I would also just remind uh, the Commission that there are still the ongoing challenges. They really haven't changed uh, in Q3, um, specifically that the national economic certainty and the rising cost of inflation, which we're obviously managing in the year, and you would have been cited on that. Um, and uh, the recruitment uh, remains to be one of the challenges that um, the majority of our services are, are dealing with at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, members. Questions? Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Gibson. Um, the school's Ofsted performance, as we now know, is 100% is uh, good or better. Um, I know this relates back to the previous one, but since that's been publicised, it's been recognised, um, would there be a way of having some sort of, uh, not a caveat, but a, a comment to say that this is increased? You made it yourself just then when you, when you set it forward, but it's almost... It, I, I looked at the, when I, I looked at that, I blinked, and I thought it was, I thought it gone backwards. And then I realised that we it just highlights the lag, something like that. I don't know if the and and that is a classic example of publishing information and it changing as soon as you publish it. So yeah, um, for it, perhaps that's that's something that we we can pick up. Um, certainly, we can pick up and an amend, um, uh, maybe for the executive. Um, we can we can state it as well. Have, you you sure? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to refer you to page. I've got small 11 or large 27. So if I can, because I, I wasn't quite sure which, which numbers that you're going by. I was just quite interested in um, the number of self service transactions processed via customer accounts is in red. I'm just interested why that should be a problem because I'd have thought in this day and age we're all doing everything. It's, um, I just wondered. Chair, if I, if I could step in as the director on that one. Um, I, I, we obviously have just gone through a process of updating our technology around our, mm -hmm. our customer self-service. I think the challenge has been that we've been just watching that number rather than driving that number. Oh, okay. So what we really want is a large base of our community to have a self-service account and are actively using that self-service account. So as we go into the next um, performance year, we will separate those two targets out and I'm specifically working with our customer service team to have that ownership of driving people on what they call channel management mm -hmm. so lots of people ringing us about services can they do that themselves mm -hmm. and can they do that with our support or just with our encouragement so what we want to do is see that number being driven up and so number of people who have accounts to be a large number of our, a large percentage of our community and then we want to see those people actively using that system so that we're actually reducing our overall cost of transaction so um, it's in the red because that's not where we want to be. That's a mm. good starting point, but we want to see that number move up. Mm. Thank you. Thanks very much. 
My next comment is small page 14, large page 30. And it's, it's really just to say how pleased I am. Because as you know, I've done the apprenticeship review and I love the fact that we've got 100% there and six apprenticeships. So I was really excited when I saw that. I thought that's wonderful. So, um, you know, congratulations. That's all I'd like to pass that on. Just lovely to see good things that we can sort of, oh, why, wonderful. Then my next one is page 35, and which is a large 35, small page 19. And I was a bit disappointed with the visits to everyone active, still low, especially for older people, and the disabilities was ex is extremely low. I mean, that's hundreds rather than thousands, and I thought that was quite disappointing. So that's just a comment. Have you got anything to say about that? Chair, I seem to be jumping in for the chief executive. Sorry. Excuse me, chief exec. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, don't, I, I, I think that might be in terms of how we've been tracking the data. We know that we've had a, a return in terms of numbers uh, back into our leisure facilities, mm -hmm. but the breakdown has not necessarily been where we want it to be. So um, I've um, tasked everyone active, and we're in the process of building a new uh, sports and leisure strategy to actually, one, understand what the need is within the borough, um, who's using services and why, and then how do we make sure that we get a better representation across the group. Um, we want to see more, more young people using services. We also want to see a much more diverse group of people mm. uh, uh, using services. So um, in this corporate plan, council plan, we did set ourselves those targets. We did set it at the beginning of the four-year period. Unfortunately, COVID then uh, oh. ran, ran riot through that. And obviously those most vulnerable um, uh, weren't encouraged to come out and, and uh, circulate as everyone else was. We now need to give confidence back to those communities that they can use their leisure services safely and with the support of the organisation. Mm. Can I just make a supplementary comment about that? The reason I picked up on this is because I've had a few residents say that since COVID, some of the activities they used to do there aren't going on. Um, I mean, particularly for the older ones, over 55, they said they had a much better range uh, of activities and so, you know, perhaps you could take that back and say that, um, for example, one person gave me very detailed, you know what they're like when you're on the doorstep, they go into detail, don't they? And um, he said that he loved the activity he used to go to because they had um, table tennis, they had other sports as well as um, more sedentary ones. And he felt it was really stimulating and he feels the stimulating um, activities aren't there. Um, it's like it's downgraded a bit, he said, and they're not offering the same um, things that he used to do. So um, where you can have group things, and you can just choose to do different activities each time. He said they've stopped doing it. So perhaps I can feed that back in. Chair, we're, we're, we're certainly looking <coughs> into that, and, uh, and as part of that, making sure that every community can participate. We'll I, I, I'll ask the assistant director for that area just to do a review with everyone active mm -hmm. to see what the program was before and who was participating and where is it where is it now and obviously the data highlights that so we've got an opportunity to go in and do something about that in an active way. Thank you. Uh, my last one was page 42 large and page 27. Um, I feel that our complaints have seem to have really rocketed and um, I don't know whether that's, because of course it, this is up till December. Has it changed since then? Has it got, up, got more? But I do think 75 in education and 61 in children is quite a lot. Sorry, which page were you on? 40? Um, 42 oh, 40. large and 27 little numbers. Oh, am I right? Am I wrong? Have I got it wrong? Probably. Oh, 43, perhaps I'm. Let me just check. Let me go. I hate these 43. big online. I hate it. You know, yeah. you're fiddling around, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 43. Actually, it's 43 and 44, actually, because it goes on a couple of pages, doesn't it? Yeah, the education one. Yeah. So, so yeah. children's services is 61, adult services 35, 
Um, and the next page, it's education, and that's 75. Yeah, so um, I don't know, uh, the Q4, I haven't seen that data yet. Um, it is something that we've had a conversation uh, corporately about. Um, there are specific activities, particularly within the people director that we're looking at, that are linked to some of these complaints. Mm. For example, we understand SEND yes. is on a significant Has, improvement yes, journey yeah. on that. Um, that said, um, we have seen a rise in other areas where we wouldn't always expect it. So um, we are looking at that. So it is, it, we're committed to looking at um, the effect that um, the conversations and the changes we were making are going to have on Q4. I don't think they'll be radically different, uh, but it is a trend that we're consciously looking at. Thank you. Thank Chair, you. that's uh, all my questions. Thank you. Councillor Brossard, did you have a question? Um, in fact, following on, really, I was going to ask some questions, but really, it's, it's very encouraging what, what Councillor Burst talked about disabled people. And I think one of the opportunities that they should have, I believe, is with swimming because I think that's therapeutic for them and it's, it's good for their, their physical well-being. It's encouraging that yesterday the Chancellor of the Exchequer did actually say that substantial sums will be set aside for swimming pools. And I very much hope that some of that money is going to find its way to Coral Reef to ensure that the pools remain open and also that they heat it to the right temperature. Um, but what I'd like to do, if I can, on page 35, <laughs> page 35, L413, Time taken in weeks to process disabled facilities grant applications. I presume that also embraces the blue badge applications. I, I'm surprised the figure is that if the, if the figure is 0.4 um, for the, this quarter, then that's excellent compared with 17.0 the last quarter. Also, there's no target. I wonder if maybe that could be j updated possibly next time round. Um, let me just go back to the because it has NA next to it, doesn't it? 413. Yeah, yeah. Um, which means it possibly is something that we're measuring, but we haven't um, originally set out to have a target against it. So it's, some, uh, it's something we're gathering data on to understand performance. But we don't have a performance target against it specifically. Fine, OK. Then, then the next line down, 414, we've got zero for the last quarter and this quarter in terms of um, BMI score. Um, but there's a target of 15%, so this may be a case of it being updated maybe next time round, I, I think. I've just got a couple of others, if I can, Chairman. 436, um, and Councillor Birch touched on that. I, I can't imagine the target is 26,600 for the number of visits for those customers with a disability. Or maybe it is. It's, it's just the, the, the comparison with what's been achieved is actually very low. So either the figure's very low or the target's very high. Yeah, and I, and I think as, as um, the exec director for delivery um, set out when these, these targets were set as aspirational um, at the start of the council plan period. Um, so they were, they were there and set against um, Activate Learning as well, obviously the, the, the contract that we have with them. Um, so it would be something that we would want to make sure that we pick up with the within the leisure strategy. Again, um, looking at the need and really identifying what the need is and making sure that we have an appropriate target um, to uh, to um, deliver against that need. Um, I don't know if ha the extent to which the evidence base was based on that figure, but you might have history. But so, so I think, Chair, when the... Um the, that target was first put in place, that data wasn't actually measured at all. Mm. And so I think some of the challenges that um, I'd set for everyone active and for the, the team were how do we start creating that data set? So both on terms of the leisure provision and in the arts and culture provision. So we were counting who came through the door but not doing the breakdown. And so that itself might be a challenge in terms of the data. I think it's right to have that as a target and to set that uh, element of how do you measure um, those different dif demographic groups. I think that's a challenge, but I don't think it's one that we shouldn't um, face up to and actually have a process to go through. So the data might be, as a, a, I saw in a report, a bit wonky, but actually the, uh, the objective of saying how do we measure this and how do we make sure that we've got that against a community profile, I think is the right objective to have. 
quite the paper. Co a couple of others, if I can. I'll try and be brief, Chairman. You're looking at me as if I've asked enough questions. Right, I will be. Page 37, then, if I can, is just really to fill in some of the gaps, I think. L418, customer visit to Times Square. There are no figures entered, but the target is 5,000. So um, I don't know whether that, again, is a couple of boxes that maybe could be filled in in the, in the next quarter. Chair, yeah, we're, we're, we're looking to revise the reception and the community hub data, so the two aren't uh, aligned at the moment. So we will bring that together for the next quarters, definitely. And then lastly, then, for 434 planning permissions granted, there's 1749 for the last quarter, and then two boxes with zero. So maybe the data hasn't been sent through to be updated. It's just obviously, you know, a query in case someone says, well, you know, why is the figure zero? Yeah, I think that's the data issue you suggest. Right, thank you, Chairman. Nothing else. Councillor Bedegar. Thank you. Uh, I think you've mentioned already this is probably a little bit too late because I was reading some of the uh, info here and already they've changed already because something else have you know, a few news items have been uh, shared. Uh, one other thing I will comment on the report is that it's very difficult to search the report itself because I think it's added as an image, so you can't really search anything. Uh, the, on page 29, broadband coverage, it says there that as part of the target, I think it's uh, L271, that we're, we have 98% coverage of uh, super broadband. But I, I recall a recent, uh, what's it called, business survey that just says 50% of our businesses have, or over 50% have access to super fast broadband. So I'm trying to, there's a discrepancy here. <coughs> where we've got, your report says 80, uh, no, 98% coverage. But the businesses are saying just above 50. Um, I have to double. Ooh. Oh, sorry, it's me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I sorry. Um, I have to double check that I, because I saw that fifty percent figure as well. Um, this is a super fast broadband coverage across the borough, and um, uh, predominantly is for residential, but they do go up to business units. Now, it starts to get quite technical about the cabinet and where the business is and connecting to Superfast Broadband. So I will double check and go back on that 50%. Um, a lot of it, um, talking to one of the providers recently, is around um, uh, businesses opting into it. Uh, and when they do, and, and for them, the, econo the economics of, of getting the Superfast Broadband down one route, say, um, an industrial estate, for example, they can get it up to the industrial estate, and then there's a question around um, the uh, getting a quantum of those businesses signed up to it to make it effective for them to go to to the businesses. So, I'll, I'll get back and get back to you and get that figure and understand what that 50% actually means. Thank you. I'm just my experience with this as a, you know when we had an office and uh, they wanted us to pay from Millbank to dig the road all the way to Bracknell. The BT guys wanted us to actually pay for that, to have the privilege of getting broadband. Right, so we, this is what I'm saying, that we need to, access is really important, not so much to the box, but to my desk, I think is what the figure needs to show. Uh, on page 27, L391 and 392, it talks about, both of them talk about percentage of temporary failed agency workers and another one talks about agency worker. Is there, because I think there's a 8% and 20 something percent. What's the difference there in the temporary? On page 27, L391 and L392. Uh, page 27 is uh, page 11. So it's 27, 11. On the quarterly indicators, uh, L391, 
percentage of vacant posts temporarily filled with agency staff, and below that it says percentage of agency staff council wide. Oh, sorry. Is this there? So, um, the, 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 there'll be different percentages because one is council wide and one is proportionately against those vacant posts, if that makes sense. So you will get a certain figure if you look at council wide the amount of agency we might be using will be both um, uh, agency come in to respond to increased demand so they're not necessarily filling a role that's on the existing establishment and then there's also agency that you'll bring in to fill the vacancies so your vacancy numbers will be smaller um, and so your percentage is going to be higher to fill those with, a, with, with agency, if that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. In, in that case, can, can, would it be better if we had numbers instead of just percentages? Is, would that yeah. be possible? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And we can take that back because that, that, for me, is part of this improvement process in how we present this data. And I'll take back your point around, you know, this is an image uh, and uh, that, that's pasted into the document. So it does make it difficult to search the information. So it, I can't promise that for the next report because it's part of the evolution of how we can, we can um, ensure that this, this is as user-friendly and an, as informative as possible. So I'll take that away, definitely. Thank you. On page 28, uh, about the bid. So this is point 2.0404. Uh, it talks about the uh, the bid does, uh, what's it called? Uh, it doesn't, what does, I'm trying to understand probably what does 100% uh, success look like or completion? What does that look like? Uh, collecting all of the bid levy yes. um, for them within year and making sure that um, we support them in, in uh, collecting any arrears as well. What what exactly is the challenge now? There's something about the IT. Why, why are we having difficulties? That's been a long-standing um, challenge for the authority, as I understand it. And it's been a compatibility, in short, between, I'm not technical, but two bits of software that we use um, to hold um, business data and being able to collect the, the levy um, from the businesses that are within the bid. Um, it's, it's taken a long time to resolve. Q3 was getting um, at the point of, can I, may I say, frustration. Um, but we've, we've now come through uh, the other side of that. And so Q4 should have a different um, commentary against it. Uh, lastly. lastly, Chair, if I may, uh, the community, uh, there's a, hold on. Oh, what is this called? The community health, uh, there's a sort of a, a lot of charts and uh, graphics. How is that gathered? I know there is a link to, there's a link to another site. Do you know how that is gathered? That, that is um, publicly available data that we, we pull from the SIP for information that uses um, co comparator information with other neighbouring authorities. So we use it really just to give a, a, a benchmark uh, and a, a sound bite as to how we're performing against others. Yeah, because I'm just trying to understand the sort of happiness rating. Nobody asked me, <laughs> and I've never seen a survey like that. Grumpy. I know I'm grumpy, but <laughs> look, come on. <laughs> Let me be grumpy. I'm a happy, grumpier person. <laughs> But I'm just, I'm wondering, is there like a, I don't know, a survey that goes out to residents or do we feed into that particular data set? And how seriously should we take the data here? Uh, it is nationally available data. So um, how they gather that information, that they'll, they'll do it through um, uh, the, the usual sort of marketing, social marketing tools that they'll that they're feed in. Um, I, I don't know how they... The, the methodology that they use to rate happiness um, uh, off the top of my head. But, but it's, it's a good point because this, this information is really there to give a kind of benchmark. Um, 
and actually if, if the Commission would like to, to scrutinise some of um, the methodology behind collecting some of this data or, or indeed the validity of, of using some of it, very happy to have that conversation. I think it will be, be very helpful because I think if I, if I, I would love to go to residents and say, look, there are a lot of people happy in Bracknell Forest. <laughs> With a smile on your face. <laughs> okay, Councillor Brown, impatient. Thank yeah, you. I was waving a lot because I was trying to tell you the TV's gone off, but oh, there you are. <laughs> I know. There, there doesn't seem to be a remote about for it, is there? Usually. There you are. That's it. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I've got a few. Just um, Mary gave me a few, but that's all right, I hope. Um, uh, first thing is about um, heathlands, of course. Um, it's page 25 and page 34 has stuff about it the extra costs for heathlands now ne not needed due to closure of the service and likelihood it will not reopen in this financial year what does this mean please and uh, is the service open now or when will it reopen so it's still in operation um, and uh, we're still working with the provider um, and um, CQC on the, in, on the assessment. Um, it's not f fully operational to its full capacity because we want to ensure that all the appropriate measures are, are in place to make sure that um, all the improvements that have been required are um, uh, in effect and taken action on. Um, so, uh, and that's where the reduced spend has been, um, because we, we're not using it in, a full, in its full capacity. If I may, um, page 26, we've got 1.01.07. Um, is business change savings, asset review, corporate landlord model. Can you tell me what those relate to, please? That one, specific one, I'll have to come back to you on the specific savings. I don't know the detail of the, of the specific, unless, Kevin, you know the specific details on the asset review. No. Uh, it, is can I it come about back to you? the, um, like the shopping centres and um, that sort of corporate landlord building stuff to do with that? Um, it, well, within the commentary, the specific reference in there is around the lookout phase two and the asset review um, for the corporate landlord. So I think that the asset review for the corporate landlord is looking at the wider estate, um, and that is in train, but we haven't concluded that piece of work yet, so we can't identify the full savings, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, then page 35, we've got L346, caseload for family safeguarding model. Um, that's quite he overloaded, isn't it? Um, is there a reason for that? Sorry, I missed what page that was on. You were page referring. thirty-five. Uh, it's L three four six. Sorry. Yes. Yes. So what you're seeing there, um, month on month, is an increase in demand. Um, and that has been reported uh, on, on a regular basis. Um, we do have a target to bring that down to 16. I know the direct, exec director of people is looking at resourcing how we can address that, um, uh, but that is a simple reflection of increasing demand. That's quite a serious one. Um, on the same page, L003, uh, oh no, we, we've addressed that before, sorry. And then um, page 36, um, point five dot o two dot o three a landfill site at Strong's Heath, a decision not to go ahead with the original di proposal. What was that, please, and what's happened? Thank you, Chair. The, um, the original proposals of the closed landfill at uh, uh, Strong's Heath was to bring housing development to the site. Um, and we'd undertaken a number of different 
pieces of work really to, to see if that was feasible. Um, the last was an intrusive survey to the site, which actually then proved that it was not viable for housing. So the original plan and the original objective was to bring forward um, uh, a, a housing scheme on the southern end of the scope of the site. That's not going to be feasible. And so we've replaced it with bringing forward an electric charging hub, which will be the sort of equivalent of a petrol station, but for electric vehicles with a cafe and most importantly, a toilet. Um, <laughs> so you can see my route home, can't you? Um, so um, that's really part of bringing forward both uh, um, a, a, a solar farm on the site, um, which will allow the site to continue to do what it's doing at the moment, which is um, breaking down those materials which are on the site, but to uh, maximise the use of the site in terms of it becoming a community asset and particularly to address the needs of people who do not have um, home charging. So rapid chargers so that in effect you'd come in, spend 15 minutes, charge up and move on in that part of the sort of road network. So yeah, we've moved from housing to a much more sustainable solution. Thank you very much. I, I think I'll take the other one offline to speak to Kevin. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, thank you. Councillor Virgo. Thanks, Chairman. Um, can I just ask a question? I know kind of the answer, but I just, I think I know the answer anyway, but I think it's worth mentioning. Um, this is on 3774, on page 37, I think. Um, and it was about the planning applications and completion. And I know there's a problem there, I, I, I'm aware of that, but I just, I'm a very concerned about this, really, to be honest, because I think this is a lot to do with economic expansion in the borough. And, you know, and I'm sure we all know this, but if, if those are delayed by a huge amount, that really has a huge effect on incomes and all kinds of things. So I just wondered what, what, what the plan is to kind of speed that up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, particularly with minor applications so and, and household applications, so they're smaller scale, but n nonetheless, um, demand for those is in increasing. So we are seeing more of those. Um, coupled with the fact that we are suffering from uh, a lack of uh, resource and being able to recruit into those roles. So um, the, the service has been looking at revising certain roles and, and job profiles to uh, make them more attractive, mm -hmm. um, to increase the, the likelihood of being able to recruit into those roles. Um, and we're also looking at getting agency in, um, which is obviously more expensive for the authority mm -hmm but you have to weigh that up with the, as you say, economic benefit of making mm -hmm. sure that we, we get those applications um, uh, through the system in, in a timely manner. So we are actively looking at, uh, at re resolving it. Um, I have to just reiterate that recruitment is a continuing challenge mm. for the authority. It, is it worth talking to local authorities generally, which I'm sure you are, but somehow um, solving this problem? Because I don't think this is just a, bar, uh, a Bracknell problem, is it? This is a problem all over. It, it is a problem across um, almost every single planning service mm. in, in every local authority. And we are having conversations. We'll obviously have conversations with our, our Berkshire neighbours as well. Um, and there is a, a national conversation taking place around how we can ensure that we are feeding the pipeline of, of new recruits coming into the system and training them up. Right. And maybe we could do some kind of training within this, this yeah, <laughs> quite. Okay, um, second question uh, is probably an easy one, but I saw that short-term sickness was, was, quite, was quite high. And I just wonder if that's something we should worry about, or is that a reason, or is it just one of those things because of winter? I think what we're experiencing is um, a, a lot of individuals that coming out of, of um, the, the pandemic, us getting used to COVID, um, and then when we, we see peaks, um, when we see sort of gatherings um, so and holiday events. So for example, the festive period over Christmas, um, uh, we saw a reduction in um, short-term um, illness and then, and then a spike again. Um, so it, it's one of those challenges. I think it, it's. Um, I don't think it's significantly high enough to cause real concerns, but I think it's something that we are still keeping an eye on, just to make sure that 
Um, we've got um, solutions in place to ensure that we're resilient when we do suffer in, maybe in sort of hot spots of temporary um, illnesses that we, we can make sure that those roles are covered. Sorry, I forgot one. Sorry? Yes, yes. I, uh, it's on page 35. I forgot this one, please. It is quite important, I think. It's um, L385 and L386 um, about uh, rate per 10,000 of children. Um, can that be translated into an actual figure? I don't know why it's quoted like that. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on page uh, 27, uh, point uh, is the uh, quarterly indicators. We've got L444, number of Facebook followers for public health. Yeah? Now, given the fact that we are going to actually see more of a bigger challenge on recruitment and you know uh, I think we just need to do more on getting people to use and help themselves online so we need technology uh, we need people to do more I I did ask before this I think two days ago whether we could have uh, statistics on what people are using online and what they're saying uh, I'm I'm a little bit shocked that uh, public health, for example, I mean, how important this is, that they only have 15 followers. I think that must, this must be a mistake, surely. It cannot be, the data cannot be correct. Well, we'll go back and we'll, we'll uh, uh, ratify the, the numbers and come back to you. Thank you. But uh, for the next, I would love to see what, uh, you know, online-wise, the, the number of people visiting this, our site, uh, because I know we're investing a lot in that, and also uh, what they're looking at, and how many of them are actually engaging online. So we have a self-service uh, portal online. How many people are actually registered on that, and what target do we have? There must be a target in terms of increasing those numbers. Thank you. Just to help with that, I mean, I've just looked up the Bracknell Forest Public Health and it says 3.1 thousand followers. Yeah. So there is... It may not be a total figure. It may be new followers um, that have registered. And it, we may have seen a peak and then these are new um, followers that are registering each month. But but I'll find, I'll, I'll go back and clarify what that figure is for you. Right. I think we need to move on. Um, item 8, which is the Overview and Scrutiny Commission Report 2019 to 2023. Now, I know it only came out this afternoon with the difficulties, and it's covering, it's different because it's covering the term of this council, so it's four years instead of the annual report. Um, and I don't know whether everybody's had a chance to look at it, um, but it is a draft. Lou, would you like to? Um, I can, or Kevin, if you want to. Okay, shall I start, and then uh, uh, the people who actually pulled it together could uh, give, give, give some information. So as you said, Chair, this is, um, uh, under this commission, we um, undertook to do annual reports, um, and as part of that annual report would pick up my assurance back to the full council that scrutiny is uh, working well and everyone is participating in that process and I'm pleased to report that we've not only done those annual reports but I may be to able to give those assurances with uh, full-throated support. Um, I think when we uh, started having the conversation with the Commission um, it was felt that it would be good to have a, for a fourth year review um, looking over the whole time of this commission, particularly on the basis that we'd agreed a different approach in terms of moving to thematic um, panels, so moving away from the, d the old directorates, but also in the, the work in terms of the review programme, having a four-year work programme 
um, with the Commission, both commi uh, commissioning that work, but also overseeing the quality assurance and then monitoring that back through the executive. Um, I think from the discussions I've had with the chairs um, that this has been a very successful and effective way of not only delivering those reviews, but participation, increasing participation across all members. And we've seen a large number of members participate in those reviews. Um, uh, COVID forcing us to go completely online did open up more people to participate in the process. Um, but I think the feedback from panels is it's great for getting participation, but we still need to be able to bring people together in a face-to-face. -to -face. And I think that hybrid working, and we've seen the chamber be changed and um, uh, uh, the full use of the technology has meant that meetings are no longer um, set in the diary and everyone having to slip to Times Square for literally 10 minutes that actually the panels have been effective, been able to have a, a range of times for their meetings, but also to have some quite lengthy reviews, so some five month reviews, but also some one and dones. So um, capturing that and being able to um, uh, put that onto the record, I think is really important. And uh, chair for your own um, chairmanship to recognize what impact you've had in terms of the organization. So. Um, the draft is really there to, um, I think most of the, 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 the <coughs> chair panels have had an opportunity to look at their areas and they've written those, those updates. So hopefully there shouldn't be any surprises in there. Um, myself and Anne Moore as the assistant director have done our top and tailing, which is our statutory responsibilities. But really um, we want to make sure that um, we've got the draft to you um, so that you could formally consider it and discuss any changes that you want and then Louise and the team can go off and do those final changes um, and I think Chair if you can undertake then to sign that off we will take that through the uh, council process so that um, there's a proper handover between this commission and the next commission um, with a clear set of what are the things that you think are important to take forward and also in terms of what areas would be worth looking at because I think again what we've learned through this four-year process is um, we need to have a program, but we also need to be able to add things into that program as issues appear. And I think we've, we've done that quite successfully. But also the fact we've recognised that we need to have a, a specific health scrutiny <coughs> um, in the same way as we do with the Crime and Disorder um, Committee. And now we have that discussion about bringing forward the blue light services. So we're absolutely keen to make sure that that's that um, baton and lessons learned is handed over to the next commission. Um, I don't know if I we, should, we, should, we should go in uh, order if Anne wanted to add to that before Louise did, um, because I think Anne's really had a different approach in terms of how we've staffed the um, reviews, which is different again to the people who handed over to us. So Anne, I don't know if you pick up. Um, yes, thank you. On the um, staffing element of the report, you will see that um, I've spoken about the restructure that we've had to Democratic and Registration Services just very recently, um, and we've kept the same sort of model and level for scrutiny because all the feedback has been that it's been working really well. So although the um, overarching manager, um, since Kirsty Hunt has gone, is, is a, a different person, it's Derek Morgan, the team are still delivering in the same way with three people, but we do have a team leader now, which is... Um, Lou has taken on that role to sort of pull some things together, move things forward, it hopefully much more quickly because she can be doing it on the ground with the team at their regular team meetings. Um, one of the things that's new to this report that, that I would just like to, to add to what Kevin was saying that um, has been put in the back is an overview of all the reviews so that you can see them together. Um, and when we started to look at it, we were really quite impressed with the number of reviews that you'd undertaken over the past four years particularly when you had the COVID issue in the middle of that period. Um, and when we think back and we compared it to um, the amount of work with the outcomes that happened before, it, it, it did feel very positive. So I would, I would commend that element to you particularly. But hand over to Lou if she had anything to add. on this for the last four years and definitely the changes that we've we've implemented um, I've had the pleasure of working with all of you so I'm I'm hoping that what I'm reflecting is what you've sort of 
done, and I think you've done an amazing amount of work in the panels. We've had the opportunity to speak to lots of different residents, parents of people with special needs, children with special needs, gone to visit cemeteries, um, talked about topics like mental health, isolation, loneliness. There's so much more that can be done. Those topics aren't just one and done. But I think it's, for me, it's trying to make sure we prioritise for the next, the next four years what, what are the issues um, going forward and how we can, what lessons we've learned over this. This is the first time we've done these you know, panels like this and there's really good learning we've got from that. We can be a bit more fleeter of foot with some issues and I think Anne and I have spoken about that and that's, there's a lot we can improve on but I think the amount of work you've done, the outcomes, the recommendations being clearer, probably need to still be a bit smarter but they've actually gone to the executive, executive looking at them and then actually we are now coming back around to review ourselves. So I think it's re has got a lot of um, potential to uh, show the impact that you've had. Thank you, Lou. Um, so members, I think just to say, uh, because this is laid out today, when you've had a chance, do feed in. Um, it's a draft. If there's a comment you wish to make, please feed it into us so that we can take it on board. I think on, on behalf of the Commission, really, there are two, two big thank yous. One, and one of the biggest, obviously, has to be our officers for the support that's been given, because there has been an awful lot of work, an awful lot of meetings, and the detail that's gone into it behind the scenes to give us the, the opportunity to talk with knowledge um, about the, the situations that we've been investigating and looking at. So thank you very, very much, and please take that back to the others that aren't here tonight. And just a sec, let me finish, Robert. Um, the second big thank you I'd like to do, and that is to the commissioners yourself, because changing this, this system, the way we were working, would not have been successful if you hadn't have put the effort and the hours in in the panel work. So again, you know, there, there's a thank you there and a recognition needs to be recorded because it's very easy to, to, to overlook that and there's been an awful lot of hours and a lot of discussion. And I think the mark of the success to me has been the reports that have been brought from the panels to the commission to the executive with the recommendations my recollection is there hasn't been one recommendation refused by the executive in those four years. So I think that's quite an achievement to, to the degree of work that you've done and, and what you've put into it. So, so let's record that. Thank you. I, Robert, did you wish to, to add something? <laughs> oh, yes. Um, to echo everything you've just said, Chairman, about the work that the Commission has done over the last four years. Um, I think it's all there for people to see. But I don't want to miss the opportunity to make the same comment I've been making about scrutiny since 2003, which is scrutiny is here to help the Council make better decisions. And clearly the Council is making better decisions with the input that scrutiny has made over the last four years on a very, very, very short shoestring. I have always maintained and I will always argue that scrutiny needs to be an equal partner between CMT and the executive. If you look at the executive resources they have available, when they are, they are taking on board the advice and the recommendations from scrutiny, just think how much more we could help this council make better decisions with more resources. I don't think we've got the balance right between those three parts of the organisation. I understand the challenge about the executive with their corporate responsibilities and all that sort of thing, but we've just acknowledged that the Commission make, and all its panels make a really, really important positive contribution to the work of this Council to our residents. And I think we could make an even bigger contribution with better resourcing. And I will never say that we shouldn't have more resources for scrutiny until the point the resources are adequate to meet the needs of this council. 
So forgive me, Chairman, I am passionate about this. I think it's so important and uh, we need to make sure resources reflect the value that scrutiny makes to this council and our residents. Thank you, Robert. Any other comments? Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to endorse exactly what Robert said, actually. And I think we can make a greater con contribution. Um, and one of the things that I think we could improve on uh, sometimes is that scrutiny don't get papers that we have to wait till they go to the executive first and then they come to scrutiny. And I think it would be a good idea if we could think in the next uh, administration that uh, this, it should go to both of us at the same time because I think we can make a contribution to this. We, we obviously can't change what the executive wants to do sometimes, but we can comment and it gives us the time to comment rather than much later coming to, to scrutiny and us having a shorter time in which to make a comment. So I, 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 I agree with Robert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Councillor Gibson here. Um, as being a long proponent of scrutiny and the value of it, um, I echo the uh, comments previously made about making sure it's properly resourced. Um, I think the attitude of the executive has been an exemplar of how they deal with um, the importance as is reflected on the acceptance of the recommendations that the various task and finish groups have made. However, it is vital that we uh, keep and uh, promote our, um, th the function by making sure it's properly staffed, properly resourced. We cannot do our job without it, and it helps the executive. In a former life where I was a cabinet member, I found scrutiny were able to look into things that I didn't have time to. I found it extraordinarily helpful. So the attitude of this council from the executive, from the officers, is, is very good, but it needs to be resourced um, and continue to be resourced well. Uh, and just a thank you to the staff for all the help they've given me since I took over as... Uh, chair a couple of years ago. Thank you. Thank you. I know it's not, we're not taking a vote, but I think I just have to also support the need uh, for adequate resources uh, because I think, you know, the work that has been done and actually in this report demonstrates the, the importance of, of this panel or this uh, commission. So it is important that we have the right resources or level of resources to help us continue this work. I also like to say thank you for the report. The report itself is very well laid out. I love the infographics then. I think it makes it a little bit easier to read. And I think we should, you know, I think this is something that the public will actually find easy to read. So thank you for that, whoever came up with that idea. Great job. Thank you. Councillor Mrs. Birch. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm actually going to say that I like the way that we particularly have worked together. Um, I think it's been really strong. I think that I'm going to say that there's a, an element of trust there. We trust each other and we've worked really well together. I think that's really powerful for the officers supporting us. And um, my thanks to them for that. Um, uh, and, you know, they have gone beyond it, even though they've had COVID and all the other stresses um i think it has been really really good and also my fellow chairman and yourself you know i think we've worked together uh, as a group and um, supported each other and i think that makes it very effective um we're, we're happy to challenge each other but we're also we're also working at the, with the same aim and i think that is very clear in everything that we produce um, so, you know, I, I'm very pleased with what we've done and uh, congratulate everybody. My last thing I'm going to say is, you know this, don't you, Sue? I'm on about this, you know, findings and observations. Really, I really think that the one thing is to get data in real time. And that is, you know, I, I look forward to the time, I haven't put it in here, that we have the dashboard and we can actually have access to it. And then we can really see and challenge what's happening. Um, so that's my last comment, if I may. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jill. 
Um, okay. We will move on to item nine, 10 and 11, which is the usual updates from the panels. Um, enforcement strategy re review. John, would you like to? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'm gonna keep it very brief because the night is nearly ending. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Some of us have been up since four, so uh, excuse me if I'm flagging a little bit. Um, this is the report before you for the um, review into the strategy uh, of enforcement, um, and it was as a direct result of the R review into the integrated enforcement review, which was carried out in September 2022. Uh, enforcement uh, is very uh, finite, and... Um, it's either very easy to enforce or it becomes very complicated uh, and involves multi-agencies. So um, we need to really understand that as members that you know it's, it's not just a very simple case of go out and enforce. It does take time sometimes and can take up to years as one of the cases proved. Um, the strategy uh, that I think the public protection demonstrated that you know, strategy can change at any time. Uh, COVID also told us that we, we have in our midst very capable and uh, superb officers uh, that can turn their hand at anything um, and assist the residents and members uh, in times of crisis. Um, so I'm gonna quickly go through the recommendations. I'm not gonna go through the report, Chair. I'll just try and put a little bit of meat onto the recommendations while we come in. So the first recommendation was the executive member for planning and transport to contact the relevant minister with request for local authorities to have greater power in deciding, uh, declining retrospective planning and uh, prevent abuse of the planning system. And I think tonight's presentation by the Royal Fire Brigade, sorry, the Royal Berkshire Fire Brigade Service, uh, Rescue and Fire Service, um, demonstrated that we've delegated powers to um, permitted development can cause problems. We know not all our developers are, uh, can I say, honourable, uh, and some will cut corners, and that can lead to problems. Uh, and sometimes you don't realise you've got a problem until it's too late. Uh, and you can have a loss of life, especially in some developments that aren't done very well. So although it's a government scheme, uh, and we do have to look at our housing crisis, I do think that our local authorities are the best placed to actually say yes or no to certain developments and it should all still go through planning. And I think our, my committee actually agreed on that one. Uh, the work on the highways, um, wherever you go, our roads or paths are being dug up. And it's not just at Bracknell Forest, it's everywhere. Um, you can't really do a journey now without actually coming across any road works. Uh, and it's, this is to make sure that residents and members are fully aware that on our website we have a system called One Dot Network, whereby people can go on and actually make sure that the works that are being carried out on the highways in their area are actually authorised. Um, if it's an emergency roadworks, then um, it won't be on there straight away, but planned roadworks will be. Uh, and if any uh, unauthorised works are identified, then we need to uh, let our highways officers know who can then go out and deal with the uh, perpetrators uh, as required. Uh, and we also require our residents to, you know, it, it's, it's intelligence and everything else. So um, you know, long may that continue. Um, we would like to better use of CCTV for enforcement. Um, and that's not only just for fly tipping, uh, and that we've had su great success with fly tipping, um, but also um, parking, uh, illegal parking, especially on taxi ranks. It'd be nice if we can actually use CCTV, AMPR, uh, to actually issue fines and not actually have people on the ground. Um, London boroughs do it very effectively. Um, so it'd be nice if we could actually learn from the London boroughs because they raise a fortune. You put one tire in the bus lane and you get a fine through the door very quickly. Um, so if we could actually develop CCTV and use that 
to actually help our officers, but also um, let our residents know that we are getting on top of uh, these type of infringements. Um, at the start of the four years, um, and this comes through the licensing as well as overview and scrutiny, the Community Safety Accreditation Scheme, or CSAS. And that is whereby people can be trained and accredited via Thames Valley Police to actually carry out um, enforcement or other things. Uh, and one of our successes at the moment is the lexicon have actually got all their security guys uh, CSAS accredited. Um, and they're now working with the public protection so that they're actually helping us with our fly posting, graffiti, and they're looking after um, people cycling, antisocial behaviour, so it makes a visit to the lexicon far more enjoyable. And we're hoping that the CSAS will actually spread their wings a little bit more into our licensing officers um, so that um, they have better powers uh, so we can actually carry out more enforcement. Uh, number five is to uh, develop and maintain the policy of enforcement regarding fly posting to ensure consistency is achieved throughout the borough. Um, it was felt that uh, that is something that is being missed uh, and there is a lot of fly posting that doesn't look very nice in our borough. So if we can actually um, have people going out, checking it and getting rid of it, that'd be great. Uh, and the final one is to improve our communication on the council website. Uh, just mentioned it about the one dot network, but also as our successes. We really do need to promote how successful our enforcement teams are. And that's within planning, highways and transport and the public protection. Um, you know, if we didn't have enforcement, then uh, there'd be carnage out there. So we do need uh, enforcement. Sometimes it needs to be very tough and sometimes it can just be a little warning. Um, but we do need it, but I think we do really need to highlight our successes and let people know how they can actually report things that they see. So if they do see some fly tipping and they can capture the number plate, fantastic. Let's let our members and our residents assist our officers in gaining the intelligence they need to successfully uh, make sure that this is a safe borough. Uh, and finally, uh, Chair, I'd like to thank uh, my panel for all their hard work, not only in this one, but all of them over the last four years. Uh, and I'm going to echo, uh, we couldn't have actually got all these fantastic reports without the um, help of our fantastic democratic service officers. And in this report, I would like to sound out to Esther. It was her first report. Uh, and as you can see, it, 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 she's pulled it together fantastically. So thank you, Esther. I know you're online tonight. Um, and without you, uh, we wouldn't have had a great report. Uh, and you did a lot of work in the background for us all to make our meetings run a lot smoothly than they would have done. So I'd like to thank you. And Chair, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, John. Are there any questions? Yep. Um. You know, welcome this. I think it's really important, and, and thank you for this and, and all the hard work. I was just going to ask you one thing about fly posting, because I've had a little bit of problem where it's on silver land or it's owned by someone else, and I've had real difficulty getting it dealt with, and graffiti um, on silver properties. So did you look into that when you did this report, or did it not come up? Uh it didn't actually come up, Jill. Um, I mean, that is basically private property. So it would be down to Silver to, in, to do their own enforcement. And I would suggest that Silver go down the line of CSAS, uh, same as the Lexicon have done. So uh, CSAS is available to any organisation. Uh, they just need to make sure that, that you know, they, they fill out the cri get the right criteria. Uh, and you know, Silver could actually have a couple of uh, patrol people going round, making sure that if people are using graffiti or fly posting, that they can actually deal with it. So, but unfortunately, our officers, because it's private property, won't be able to. Right. Thank you. If there are no other questions, to 
Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, I have a question. Do we, uh, doing your research and review, do, do we have enough resources to actually uh, perform or carry out the enforcement that we can actually do? Good question. Uh, I think by Bracknell Forest joining forces with West Berkshire and it was at the time Wokingham, uh, it meant that you could draw on a lot of wealth of staff. Now, unfortunately, Wokingham have dropped out, but you know, uh, West Berkshire and uh, Bracknell still do provide some services for them. So we can actually call upon other officers. Um, but I would say it's like all councils at the moment, they are struggling to recruit specific uh, officers, uh, but there is a process. Uh, they are going through apprenticeships uh, and they have just uh, got, I think it's four apprentices that are going to be going through like environment and health um, trading standards. So we're gonna build our own, develop our own, which will actually be far greater for the council or the public protection, uh, but there are vacancies, but uh, the public protection <coughs> led excellently by Sean Murphy is looking at other ways to try and fill those gaps. So rather than just going out uh, advertising and competing with other boroughs, um, it, we're gonna try and develop our own uh, through apprenticeships. And I think that's an excellent way forward for, you know, and I think other departments should follow suit. Thank you. Um, there are no other questions. Can, can I therefore take it, commissioners, that you are willing to support this, this report going forward to the executive from the commission? Yes. Yep. yep. Any opposing views? No. Thank you very much. Then we move on to the next item, which is the, the blue badge review. Um, which was actually done a, quite some time ago when uh, Malcolm Tullett was the chairman of that panel. Um, but Mike, you picked up that panel. Would you like to just tell us about it? Yes, Mike Gibson here. Um, just want to say that uh, this, uh, actually what's before you is a review, an evaluation of the review, not the blue badge review. No. Um, I'm pleased to report that the recommendations from the Blue Badge Review have been taken on. Uh, we did find that there were some delays, but we got explanations of that, which was very helpful, and it has sparked some further interest uh, in consultation with the DAF for a meeting on the 22nd to discuss it. Um, you've got the report in front of you, so I'm not going into detail on, on what it says, apart from what I've just said there. Um, so I would actually recommend that this uh, report goes forward to the executive on the 22nd. Okay, thank you, Mike. Are there any questions? No? Is everybody happy to support yeah. the report going forward? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Then we move on to item 11. Uh, Jill, Councillor Birch. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, child criminal exploitation. As I say in the introduction, it was going to be county lines, but during the pandemic, county lines sort of morphed into something else because actually, as everybody's aware, nobody was traveling by train anywhere or we weren't traveling between um, places because of locked, several lockdowns. So um, what happened was it, it really changed. And so we went into the child criminal exploitation route to have a to look at how it had changed. And um, we've got recommendations here. Um, but I think really one of the main things is we were working in collaboration with the police, with um, our community safety partnership. We were working with everybody within social services that deal with these young people and the youth service. And I think you know working with all those people was really very interesting and shows how we as a council actually work in partnership really well. Um, I felt that people were really, um, they were really honest and upfront. Um, and um, I'd like to thank Joey actually, because it's really hard getting all these people together um, because of diaries. And it was quite a challenge actually getting the police um, to a meeting, if I'm honest. Um, but we did manage to get everybody together and we've come up with these recommendations 
And a um, lot of them are for our partners. They're not just uh, for us. And I think, um, you know, I think it is aspirational, some of them, and I've put quite tight time scales. But I think, it, you know, we've got to be ambitious because these are our young people um, and it's really important. So the first recommendation is collaborate with Thames Valley Police and other relevant partners and develop and implement regular child criminal exploitation awareness campaigns. So it's within schools targeting children and parents because there did seem to be a lack of actual awareness um, and making sure that they were going in and talking about this. Second was engage with local businesses and community, community organisations to raise awareness throughout the business and, and communities about this and create safer places for children and young people. And I think that was a real key thing so that young people could go somewhere in a safe environment, congregate together and know that they were um, okay. <coughs> Number three is conduct a comprehensive review of the website. And this was where actually we worked as a group in the council chamber. We came actually to a, a room on this floor and we were able to really look at this and um, I think it needs to be updated. Number four was develop and implement a survey focused on CCE for safeguarding leads from schools in the borough and to identify gaps and areas for improvement in existing policies and practices relating to CCE um, and to consider working again with us. So when we review it, that's working with the survey and actually us looking to see what the schools have said. So that's actually an action on us as well. Number five is conduct regular awareness campaigns on the use of cannabis. This was a very interesting one. This was from the police particularly came forward and said that people weren't aware of the effect of cannabis because nowadays it's a much stronger variety, um, much uh, greater strength. So it actually affects young people when they're teenagers. It does affect them mentally. And some, for some young people, it has a really poor, devastating effect on them. And their mental health is really compromised. And it can lead right into their adulthood. And I think that is really, it was really powerful, actually, some of the evidence that we heard. And um, I think that that should be made aware because it's becoming almost a norm that some of these young people try cannabis and actually use it, whereas some of the aspects that we were talking about, it, it really does affect their psychosis and um, it can be damaging. So six, work with partners to develop and maintain a map or database of vulnerable areas and hotspots. And this came directly from the police, um, that they said that they were aware of this, but they weren't mapped. Like we do map antisocial behavior, we do map where there are high crime areas of certain things, but this has never been used um, to inform. So I would say I'd recommend these to you. And um, it was an extremely interesting um, review to do. And I thank everybody who took part. Um, the uptake of people and their commitment to it was, was brilliant. Thank you, Jill. Are there any questions? Jill? Yes, please. Um, there's lots of um, collaborate and engage and conduct and develop and so on. Lots of actions to be taken as a result of this. Um, who's in charge and how will we make sure that all of those things are done? Please. So um, it goes to the executive and I think John Harrison is the executive member and he will take on some of these and be working with the police. And I, we, when we monitor it, we will see how it goes. Is that a good enough answer for you? Um, yeah, there's, there's no particular plan at the moment then to, but that's to be developed. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Bedeville. Thank you. Uh, 
did you uh, manage to speak to any schools at all uh, in this review? We contacted them. Um, we were doing a survey, but actually it was a really difficult time and schools were very busy. That's why we've got the survey to go back to schools um, because it was very difficult to, to actually engage with them. We wanted to engage with the SENCOs, we wanted to engage with the schools, but it was actually at a very difficult time. And because um, we started this just before Christmas and it was, it, it just wasn't practical, we couldn't do it. Thank you, I was, I was just thinking for, for the recommendation to, uh, to, to sort of append the, uh, the feedback from the survey that you sent before it goes to the executive because it will be very uh, nice uh, or important to have those feedback from the schools uh, in here if, if possible. So as a panel, hopefully we will, the survey will come from us after this and then we'll, we'll, we'll do it afterwards, but it's actually not at the moment. Okay, and lastly also, we are on recommendation six, work with partners to develop a map or database of vulnerable areas. I'm assuming this, this is going to be something that is only accessible to partners and not the public, or else you know, you, you will basically, you're sharing intelligence with the people that are likely to use this and just move on to wherever there's no hotspot. Mike, I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit confused. Sorry. Your name is down here as being on the panel. Uh, so, <laughs> right, But that doesn't stop me from asking questions, surely. Oh, or, or does you're it? You're asking I don't questions know. you should know the answer to because you've been working I'm, on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> huh? No, I'm, I'm just asking questions. It's yeah. all right. We don't need yeah. asking questions at this time of night and <laughs> when you should know the answers because you're on the panel. Yeah, I'm still asking questions. Okay, well, we've, you've asked your questions. We're moving on. Um, are there any other questions, <laughs> dare I say? <laughs> no, right. Commissioners, <laughs> you have the recommendations there. Are you happy for those to go forward from the commission to the executive? Yeah. Anybody against that? Thank you no. very much. Well done, Jill. <laughs> and the panel, thank you. Right. Just when you thought it was all over. Uh, I'm going I'm to have a sort of 11A item here. Any other business? Because um, it's the only place I can think to, to receive an update. Because quite some time ago now, climate change was a feature of this commission. Um, and, and then it got moved. Um, Councillor Virgo has been very active in that and remains active in that and has asked just to give you an update so you've not completely departed from something really that you started. So Tony, if you'd like to just give us a brief update. Thanks Mr Chairman, I'm not going to do that, don't worry because we'll be here for 20 minutes. Um, but what I'd like to do, because um, the panel has been like the panels here, been working very hard on things, and we've had some really good presentations, I think Kevin would agree with that, uh, from different technical people. And um, obviously climate change is important. We talk about it now constantly on everything we do. So what I'd like to do, Mr Chairman, is just to write a tiny little report um, and I'll send it to you, distribute it, and, and it will just sort of say the things that we've discussed um, and also the visits we've done and some recommendations that we'd like to do and also some kind of um, uh, future kind of ideas uh, in the next administration. So that's all I'd like to do tonight. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the update, Tony. I'm sure members will appreciate having that to refer to. Um, there's an item 12, exclusion of the public and the press. That was if we had anything to go into the pink, but we haven't, so we won't have an item 12, but we will have the end of the meeting. Um, and just to, to bring your attention, um, it does say on your paper data next meeting is scheduled for the 8th of June, but this may change to the 1st of June, so it's just to, for you to note. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but, but Mr. Chairman, before mm -hmm. Sorry, you Mr. close the meeting, I feel like saying, 
Councillor Angel, this is your life, you know, oh. that's what we should say. <laughs> no, um, I'd just like to say thank you very much, and I'm sure we all would do. Um, some of the councillors that have done a lot of hard work obviously won't be here in the future. In fact, we may not be any of us here in the future, let's be honest. But um, if I may just say on, on behalf of all the councillors here, to you, uh, Bob, thank you so much for chairing it. And um, thanks for your patience. I think that's the main thing. So, uh, yeah, that's to me. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>